Okay, so I, I can imagine this is a pretty diverse audience, so I tried to uh, make uh, this sort of accessible to sort of tell you about the kind of work that I, I, I do. So I'm a statistician, but I've only worked with one kind of data in my career, and that's brain image data. Um, and so I'll talk about some of the, the old methods I've used, but mostly I'll talk about sort of the new type of data that sort of has forced me to change the way uh, I work and, and show you some of the, 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 the results that we've uh, been doing. So um, neuroimaging is, is fun because you get to make pictures. My, the, the output of any of my analyses is, a, is, a, a, is, is an image and sometimes fancy rendered images. Uh, and there's been actually psychological studies that people uh, find uh, psych psychological results more compelling when there is a candy colored uh, blob next to it than when there isn't. Uh, so people love doing these things. Uh, but there is more to it than just the, the flashy, flashy cameras, uh, the flashy pictures. Um, and the, the, the reason for this is that, you know, of course, we're interested in the brain. Uh, uh, there has not been a lot of success in, in uh, a lot, not been a lot of advancements in treating, especially psychiatric disorders. And so there's been a lot of interest in, in trying to use brain imaging techniques, especially magnetic res resonance imaging, to try to uh, understand mental disorders like schizophrenia, uh, depression. They have a sort of incredible cost. I mean, just for one thing, uh, just for me mental disorders and as a whole, uh, one price, uh, one, one uh, uh, website put the, the cost at 100 billion per year in terms of disability and loss of, of earnings. So before we had brain imaging, we had to wait for cerebral accidents. So neuropsychology uh, uh, is a study of basically how do people's behavior change after their brain has changed due to some, some accident. Uh, and so usually this is a, a stroke, or perhaps you've heard of this very famous American, Phineas Gage, in the, the 19th century, who was putting a, a, some dynamite down a hole uh, to make a wa railway, and the, uh, the, 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 the stick uh, went clear through his cheek and through his frontal, frontal pole, and his behavior changed dramatically. Now you might say that's because his brain was just blown out, but he actually recovered quite well and physically was fine, uh, but changed from being sort of very sort of nice, uh, even-tempered uh, person to someone who swore a lot and was was uh, uh, irritable. And uh, so this was sort of posed the, the assertion that you know maybe personality is really located in the front of the brain. Maybe the brain is not like the liver that homogeneously does something like clean our blood. Maybe different parts of the brain do different things. Um, so, but now we don't have to wait for people's brains to get blown out. Um, we have functional MRI. Um, and what's really cool about magnetic resonance imaging is that this one device can give us so many different types of data. So I mainly work with functional magnetic resonance imaging. That's where we put someone in the scanner and we measure them over time while they do a task. Or sometimes, and of late, we just tell them to rest there without falling asleep. And then we try to understand how different parts of the brain are working together. But this is just some of the illustration of the different types of uh, data you can get out. So there's, uh, uh, you can get images of, of gray matter or white matter. You can also, uh, there are different parameters. There are basically two main knobs that you can control. And they generally control something called the T1 contrast and the T2 contrast. And so these is a, this is a T1 weighted image and a T2 weighted image. And with these, you can infer where is there gray matter, where is there white matter. There's also something that's really cool that we can learn about how water diffuses in the brain. So there's something called diffusion tensor imaging. And that lets us basically find, now you can see this is very different. This part here, that's part of the white matter of the brain. And that's telling us that there were very strong fiber bundles. This is basically the wires that connect the different uh, transistors, the, the neurons, uh, in the brain. Um, so the, the MRI is really neat in that, in that way, that one single machine can give us so much different information. Um, and then for any one of those, we might actually have different analysis techniques that could give rise to, to different pieces of information that can come out. So that's that mo mainly I've worked with MRI uh, because it's, it's really fun. It, it, you know, you basically you just wait two or three years and they'll invent some new kind of data that they can get out of this machine, uh, which, is, which is really fun. Um, so let me contrast sort of old, what I would call old and new brain imaging studies. So this is a classic study. You may have heard about it uh, where they, they studied the brain structure of London taxicab drivers who famously have to learn the knowledge and they compared it to uh, 30 controls. And uh, they, they found that there was a difference in this one part of the brain called the hippocampus. And we know that the hippocampus is involved in memory, uh, particularly because when people get their hippocampus taken out, they suddenly can't make new memories. Um, and so they showed this correlation, and this is actually just looking at the, the just at taxi drivers, basically, does the size of the hippocampus vary with how much time you spent 
for the taxi driver. And they found, found that the taxi drivers that had spent the most time driving a taxi had the biggest hippocampus. So this is pretty neat. This is showing that, wow, there's, there's some aspect of what you do actually affects uh, your, your brain structure. But this is, I would say, old school because basically, well, it's just an observational study and it's just 16 drivers. Now, I think results like this have been replicated, but I think there are a number of results also that you probably haven't heard about that didn't get published in science that don't necessarily get replicated, or even studies that do get published in science that don't, don't get replicated. Um, and so there's been a drive to sort of go beyond these very small sample sizes to um, doing things that are, that are, are, are bigger. And, and why, is this, why is this important? Well, when you have such small sample sizes, you have something that your power is very low. So what is power? So power is uh, something that's fundamental. It's basically the, the probability of a true positive. So when there truly is an effect, what's the probability that you'll be able to detect that effect? Um, and the, the problem is that if your study has, has low power, uh, even if you do find an effect, you won't, you won't necessarily replicate it. So first of all, this is just a plot showing of how, embarrassingly how low the sample sizes are in this particular discipline of functional MRI. They're, they're, they're rarely larger than, say, 25. But this was a really sobering uh, study. This was a meta-analysis of meta-analyses in neuroscience. And using some, because when you look back at meta-analyses, you can actually infer what was a good guess about what the true effect size, the true strength, strength of the effect is. And you can look at each study and saying, well, if the true effect was this, what was your power to detect? And so they can go through, and they went through a whole big part of, part of the neuroscience literature, and this is a histogram of all the different power they found. A handful of studies had good power, sort of 80% or, or above, but the median power was 20%. That's really sobering. That's saying when there truly is, 20% power says when there is a true effect to be detected, you only will detect that one out of five times. So that's why this is, is so, so sobering. So even if you find an effect with a small sample size, it's unlikely that anyone else is going to be able to reproduce this. So this is kind of a science-wide drive that people are engaging and talking about, that sometimes they talk about it as the reproducibility crisis. Uh, not in my own area, but in psychology, they went and they tried to reproduce 100 famous psychology experiments and found that they could re reproduce about a third of them. Uh, and this is all pushing this drive to what can we do to make uh, the re results that we, we do find uh, more believable, more reproducible. So that's leading to what's something that I, I would call population neuroimaging. So instead of getting the 16 undergraduates you know, that you have access to, um, why don't we try to use a population sample? So not a sample of convenience. That's, that's what you do when you throw open your door and ask people to come in. Um, but actually try to find some way to sample a population. This is not easy. This is, this is harder. This is more work. But the idea is that whatever your inferences are, they should be more representative of the, the larger population. And of course, you're set up to get more, more people. So uh, I'm going to do a diversion and talk about the machine learning. Then I'll come back to a, a population um, neuroimaging study that, that I'm involved with. But first, I wanted to just define some basic concepts in machine learning, because we're actually going to put them to use in the setting of where we actually have a whole, a whole population. Um, so uh, basically, if you've, you've heard anything about machine learning, there are two broad classes. There is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So Unsupervised, let me do this for the second one that I'm not actually going to say much about. Unsupervised learning is just exploratory. Is there structure somewhere in the data? Supervised learning is where you actually know something you're interested in. Say, the, uh, the, do you have the disease or not? Did you recover? Uh, did you actually go on to uh, get cancer again? Did you have a relapse? Or what's your, sim uh, what's your symptom score? That is, and the idea is that you try to predict that thing that, uh, in, in a new sample of people. So you might say, how long have you had the, the disease? What's your age? Do we have any information like blood work or brain imaging data? And then can we make a prediction? So you build a, a classifier or a prediction device to basically take the input and map it to output with the idea that eventually, now when new data comes in, all I need are the inputs, and now I can make a prediction about the output. But this is different from classical statistics. Um, so in classical statistics, oftentimes we're concerned with making inferences on the population. So here's to lead brain imaging all together. Here's a very simple ex example. So let's say we're trying to infer, is the population mean of men's hair length different from women's hair length? It's a silly thing. We know that, that they are different. But here might be so the population of all hair, uh, sort of the average, sort of say, what's the mean of my hair length? And what's the average of women's 
uh, of, of an individual's uh, hair length. It's different in the population. Not everyone has the same, uh, not everyone has the same uh, hair length, and in particular, there's an overlap, right? So some women have shorter hair than men, and some men have longer hair than, than women. But if I was trying to make an inference on are those two populations different, well, I could say get 60 men and 40 women, and then this thing here describes the sampling variability of those two. And in particular, I've tried to illustrate, of course, if I have more men, I'm going to have a more precise estimate of where is the sample mean, the population sample mean for the men, where is the population sample mean for the women. So this is classical statistics. And in this little toy illustration, I would, very ha I would have great power to distinguish the fact, to assert the fact that men and women have different uh, uh, hair lengths. And I would reject the null hypothesis that they they are, are, are equal. Now, machine learning, we're trying to do something different. We're trying to take one individual, you play a game, you tell me the, the, the hair length, I'm going to guess whether they're a man or a woman. That's a, a completely different uh, thing. And now we have this problem that just based on the hair length alone, I'm always going to be, for all these women here, I'm going to be wrong. And for all these men here, I'm going to be wrong. And so this is a much harder thing. But that is the essence of machine learning. It depends on basically the how, how distinguishable are the two populations in terms of the thing you can measure. So in general, it's always harder than the classical uh, inference procedures in one, in one dimension. So you might ask, well, how does this ever, you know, how do you get, ever get anything done in machine learning? And the, and the key is you would never do it in one dimension. In machine learning, you always try to look to have multiple dimensions. Now, this works better for an American audience, but uh, we could collect some other piece of information, like how many baseball caps do you own? So now I have the average hair length. How many baseball caps do you have? Now I have two pieces of information. And of course, I'm making this simpler than it can be, but you can see just in hair length, a lot of overlap. Just in terms of number of caps, a lot of overlap. But in this two-dimensional sp space, in this plane, I can actually distinguish these two populations. And that is the key to machine learning te te techniques, is that we're, you're always working in some high dimensional space, trying to figure out in this high dimension, can I distinguish the, the, two, the different populations I'm interested in, or can I use this high dimensional space to make some prediction about uh, you know, disease uh, duration or, or, or some, some sort of continuous outcome. So uh, just to say that this is a very generic thing that we always are trying to, to map from the, the the, the, we're trying to map from the data, the, the features, to these labels. So it might be man, woman. It could be uh, some sort of disease outcome and what have you. And that, that this works for either for, for classification, when we're trying to predict something that's uh, binary or, or discrete, or prediction. We could be trying to predict some sort of you know, disease duration, time to relapse, um, what have you. Now, I'm not going to go into all the, 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 the gory details, but I'll just throw up some things that are different. So in classical statistics, generally, we just say, do I have a good estimate? Do I have a p-value confidence interval? Well, we have different things in machine learning. We have to figure out how are we going to build this, this, this function? How are we going to build a tool that's going to take us from the data here, number of uh, 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 caps owned and hair length, to the prediction? Um, so and one of the key problems that we have, and especially in high dimensions, is this problem of overfitting. So if I'm trying to learn, so if, I, if here if the case is I have a, 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 my information is on the x and the, the, the outcome is on the y, and I'm trying to sort of basically learn that curve, well, if I fit a straight, and, and the true function is in green, if I take the straight uh, curve, well, that's no good. Uh, I could use a linear slope, that's still not very good. Co co a third order polynomial, that's pretty good. But actually, oh, well, that's the best result down there. A ninth order polynomial fits that data perfectly without error. That must be the right answer, right? No. Well, this is the overfitting problem, that if you use a complex enough model, you'll eventually fit your data perfectly. But of course, that's a horrible estimate of that green line. We're, we're overfitting. We're not learning what the true um, sort of relationship is. So in machine learning methods, we're always having to figure out some way to figure out, is our result generalizable? Yes, that, that red line on the bottom has perfect fit, but it will not generalize to future data that is clustered or that's coming from that green line. So we use something called cross-validation. I'm describing it in words here. Let me just put up a figure here. Cross-validation is basically we take all of our data except one subject, and we use all this data to, to build this classifier, to say what's the best way that we can predict whether it's male, female, or age, or disease duration, uh, to, uh, time to relapse. And then we make a prediction about the one subject that we held out. And then we see, 
uh, and then we do the whole thing again, leaving out the second subject, and this third subject, and so on and so on. And so what we have is that for each subject has played the role as, of being the test, the held out. And so we get, if we have 20 subjects, we have 20 true data estimated, or sort of true status, male, female, guess, and then we can measure the accuracy. In fact, we can do things like uh, re receiver, uh, receiver uh, uh, operation curves, uh, uh, operation, receiver operation, receiver, receiver operation characteristic curves. You always think the C is for curve, but it's not. Um, so that's the simplest form. You also can do something called k-fold cross-validation, where you chunk up the data into blocks. And then you, for, for example, on fourfold, you would take these three and use that to train our model, and then and then test uh, uh, the, the left what's left out. And in each in each turn, each one of these four folds will play the role of test data. Um, so again, in, in these sort of methods, we don't have the, the theory that gives us the p-values or the confidence in intervals. We have to use this cross-validation approach to to figure out uh, do we have a good model? Will it, will it will it fit? So um, skipping all the details about sort of you know regularized uh, regression techniques and, and and other things, turns out there are ways to fit a flexible curve, but make sure it's not too wiggly. And so there's something called ridge regression, which does ask the problem is that ridge regression has this free parameter, how wiggly. So you can do no regularization. That's basically penalty parameter of of zero, or you could do really strong regularization. Well, that's no good either. Now that's still a curve but it's just a very, very, very non-wiggly curve. So we have to use cross-validation to figure out what is the best of these, uh, what's the best value of lambda to use, but of course, that itself requires another nested cross-validation, thank you. So let me just skip ahead then now to actually where we put these things to work. Um, so the, the population neuroimaging uh, project that I was involved with came from the States, it's, and it was based on the Missouri Twin Registry. So they actually, in the 1990s, went to every single twin that was born in this state and said, would you like to participate in this research? And that should be an unbiased sample of an entire state and should be representative uh, for that, that sample. So, a lot, uh, so 20 years later, this human connectome project ran. These twins were now 20 to 36 years. They're uh, you know, young adults. Uh, and we, we scanned them uh, and their twins and also their siblings if it was available. So this is really cool data sets. Now this is no longer 10 subjects. That when, the, when the study's all done, there are gonna be 1,200 subjects and there have been extensive testing. There will be hundreds of measurements about drug use, personality, uh, what have you, and a, the state-of-the-art MRI uh, data. So I'll just show you some of the, the things that we were interested in. One of the things was basically how are different brain regions wired together in this, with this resting state fMRI. So this is where we stick people in the scanner and tell them to do nothing. And can we learn from these connections uh, whether are these connections predictive of things like uh, intelligence uh, or other measures? So we start by breaking the brain down into say 50 or 25. We tried it for lots of different ways, but here we broke it down into 50 different regions and we looked at the strength of connectivity between each of these regions. And we can look at, that, uh, we can look at it in both in terms of the, the direct strength of connection or something called partial correlation, which it should be the sort of a, the accounting for all the other indirect uh, uh, connections. And so we use this information to say, can I predict things like intelligence or, or reading score? And so if I have a 50 measures, that means I have 50 times 49 divided by two or 12,000 to 1,200 edges. And I'm gonna use the strength of the connectivity between different brain regions at those uh, at those uh, 1,200 edges to see if I can predict things about these individuals. And the actual things I'm trying to predict, one by one, I'm gonna try to predict 280 different measures, things like IQ, life satisfaction, stress, dexterity. The, uh, the long short of it is, uh, and I'll, so we had to use machine learning methods, we had to, we used cross-validation to figure out what is the best way to map from these connectivity, these 1,200 con connectivity measures to uh, the behavior. And uh, you can go on, this is online, I'll show you the URL, you can look at this. The long and short of it is that it, um, it, it didn't work so well. So here's one of the few, <laughs> this, the best measures we could get out of it. Reading, uh, it, we could actually get age-adjusted reading ability. We, we, could, we could explain about 10% of the variance in reading ability could be explained with these brain connectivities, but that was about it. And it's really silly things like, the quarter in which the data was acquired also was, you, we could predict it really well because they changed some of the techniques, the way they collected the data and how they pre-processed it. Um, so I'll skip that and then, uh, so here's the URL um, and we can make these slides available. Um, and I'll just, uh, I think I have time to go 
to go, whoop, yeah, yeah. Um, to then talk, to, to do the next thing. So what, I, well, the, what this work here was, was going through every single one of these measures, every 280 of these measures and see, can I predict one of these based on the brain data? So I have these 1,200 edges, and can I use those 1,200 edges, how the brain is connected, to predict uh, weekday beer, wine cooler consumption, you know, whatever. That didn't come up so well. Um, but the, the more sort of sophisticated thing would, would be, well, wait a minute, can I use, where is it? Can I use all of those variables? Can I use all of the, the brain imaging measures to, con to relate to all of those behavioral measures? So that's what we tried to do. Something called, something called CCA, this is canonical correlation analysis, answers this very question. Can I find some linear combination of all the brain connectivity measures and some linear combination of all the subject measures that best connects? And if there's some connection between them, uh, that, that maybe I can, I can learn about that. And we did this uh, with 280 measures and uh, with different levels of, of resolution. Here we used the 200 uh, decomposition. We used 200 uh, uh, patches over the brain instead of 50. So we had an, uh, 20, 000, about 20,000 edges that tell us about brain connectivity. And surprisingly, we got one thing, just one thing. Well, I mean, it's better than no things, but we did get one thing that popped out, and it was actually quite astounding. So basically, it is uh, positive, negative life factors. So basically, picture vocabulary, fluid intelligence, delay discounting, life satisfaction. Okay, that's on this one end. What's the other end? Positive tests for THC. So this is not, have you ever smoked pot? This is, do you have THC in your bloodstream right now when you're getting scanned? Um, total weekdays, tobacco use, drug alcohol problems, father, sleep quality, uh, tobacco use, anger, aggression, rule breaking, uh, still smoking, thought problems. So it's pretty depressing. That's saying that we could find in, there was some linear combination of all the brain connectivity data that explained this kind of gross measure of sort of, you know, positive negative life factors. Now this is just with 500 people we've gone through because we now have more data and we find that there are more dimensions that come out so there are more facets of it but it's it's pretty uh, it was pretty astounding that, that that came out what did that connect to so this is the the measure, subject measure be, uh, 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 weights you it's harder to visualize the edge weights but we, we can and they actually t relate to some established networks that we know about there's something called resting state networks and there seems to be differences in the strengths uh, between these these these, diff these these known brain regions um, that relate to those positive negative uh, scores. So um, these are just some of the things that we've we've done uh, with population neuroimaging. I think it's an exciting area. There's lots of fun things to do. It's really getting beyond these little tiny sample sizes that we maybe shouldn't really be be trusting going forward. Um, and it allows us to do to use these machine learning techniques.